the main thing I really wanted to get across is that there are lots of existing frameworks and Quick is not yet just another one that has a different DX. Like it's a fundamental rethink from the ground up of how a web application should work. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Raygun. They give software teams instant visibility into the quality and the performance of their software. And I'm here with John Daniel Trask, co-founder and CEO of Raygun. JD, talk to me about the joy a team feels when they're able to find and resolve an issue even before a customer has a chance to get upset or reach out to support about the issue. Talk to me about that. Well, I find it pretty exciting to be able to hit it off early. So and being able to tell people that you resolved something, so maybe they come through you know, and they do report an issue and you can say, cool, well, we don't need to ask you for any more context. We've got all the details and we can have this fixed tomorrow. It turns an at-risk customer into an absolute raving advocate. So that's a huge win. And then the other thing that was a little bit embarrassing we launched Raygun, but we had these other products and we instrumented them. And that's when we realized this less than 1% of our users would ever actually report a problem. And so you're sitting there thinking your software is actually not bad. And actually, <laughs> it's really, really bad. And that's hurting all of your conversion rates, business performance. You know, these aren't really dev tools, they're actually business tools. All right, if you want to see how this dev tool impacts the entire business, head to raygun.com to learn more and start your 14 day free trial, no credit card required. Join thousands of customer centric software teams who use Raygun every single day to deliver flawless experiences to their customers. Again, raygun.com. This is JS Party, your weekly celebration of JavaScript and the web. Subscribe to the pod. If you haven't already, head to jsparty.fm for all the ways. And if you dig the show, please do tell a friend or a colleague. That'd be pretty cool. Special thanks to our partners at Fastly for shipping all of our pods super fast to wherever you listen. Check them out at fastly.com. And to our friends at fly.io. Post your app servers close to your users. No ops required. Learn more at fly.io. Okay, hey, it's party time, y'all. Hello, hello, everybody. It's Jared, your internet friend, and I am excited for a great JS Party Town today. We'll see about that teaser. I'm joined today by my friend K-Ball. What's up, man? Hello, hello. Excited for this show. I'm excited, too. We have Mishko Hevery. You may know him from Angular. He's now working at Builder.io as the CTO, and he has a new framework for us to check out. Quick, that's Q-W-I-K. Mishko, welcome. Thanks for having me. We're excited. We're going to let you give us the sales pitch for Quick. Why? Not just it's a good thing for people to use, but like K-Ball should be using it. Jared should be using it. We're going to get into that and all the details. I'm sure we have plenty of questions for you around it. But first, it's time for our regular segment. It's time for Holla. Of course, Holla is our opportunity to Holla at different community events, meetups, and things going around the JavaScript and web community. So today we are holla at React Brussels. This is the first in-person React conference in the heart of Europe. It's taking place October 14th, 2022. As I said, in person, it's a hybrid, so it'll also be online. Tickets are on sale now. Uh, they've announced the first round of speakers, some awesome speakers announced already, and they're announcing more on August 1st. So if you're listening live, you can get in on the cheapest tickets available today. If you're listening after we produced it, sorry, price has already gone up. So check out React Brussels. I've talked with the organizers. They're very cool, very nice people. In fact, one of them was at JS Nation hanging out with Nick Nisi while we were there. And sounds like a really awesome conference. I've never been to Brussels myself. Have either of you been to Brussels? Have not. Okay, ball no, Mishko? I think I flew through there at some point. Okay. Airports almost count. I've definitely, I would upgrade my number of cities I've been through if I count the airports, but I've never been to Brussels either. And I would certainly love to go. If you're in the area, October 14th, sounds like a fun time. Check it out at react.brussels. Okay, let's get into it. Quick, an HTML first framework. Mishko, there's lots of frameworks out there. You're the creator of one of them. It's still out there. People still use it, K-Ball. Lots of people are still using it. But there's React, there's Vue, there's Svelte, there's new frameworks like Fresh from the Dino side. 
why another framework? The million dollar question. Yeah, that's a very good place to start. You know, why another framework? And you're right, there is a dime a dozen for them, or isn't there out there? So I'm going to go on a limb here, and hopefully I'm not going to be too controversial. And I'm going to say that, like, all the existing frameworks you're familiar with, Angular, Vue, Svelte, et cetera, and kind of Angular, I'm going to maybe take some credit here, kind of started the trend of component-based client-side frameworks. They all are essentially the same in the sense that how they work but of course, the syntax and the DX is very different, right? So do you like your templates in the form of a string? Do you like them in the form of a JSX? Do you like them inline together with the code or separated in the files, et cetera? These are all different kind of trade-offs different frameworks make. But on the, in the heart of them, like at the core of how they work, they're all essentially the same. And what I mean by that is that they really have one concern, and that is to just render things on the client. And that's pretty much what they kind of all do. And so quick is a different thing, right? Quick is what I call resumable. And the best way I can explain resumable is, well, let me back up a second. So the existing frameworks that we have, I call them replayable, meaning that when they are start up on the client, so if you do server-side rendering, they have to replay all of the work that the server did in order to get them in the correct state, right? And we, we have a word for that, and that word is hydration. And what that means is that when you navigate to a page, you might immediately see a server-side rendered content, but there is some time before you can actually interact with the page. And the problem is, the more complicated the page becomes, the more time it requires to wake up. And of course, we have tricks like lazy loading, but it turns out lazy loading doesn't quite work here because lazy loading is only useful for components that are not currently in the DOM tree. If a component is in a DOM tree, you have to hydrate it. And that means that even if it's lazy loaded component, you have to load it and then do all this stuff. So all of that means in practice that especially on mobile devices and slow connections, the startup performance is kind of bad. And Google has this thing called Google PageSpeed Score. And they, they measure and they look at different websites and how they do. And they're just trying to kind of push the industry towards like faster, better experiences for the end users. And the Google PageSpeed Score is not very good for most websites, right? So, and then the reason I'm going to argue for that is because all these frameworks have this thing called hydration. So yeah, I kind of spoke for a long time in the, in the thing and I haven't really talked about quick, but does that make sense so far? I'm with you. Okay, well, you with him? Yeah. Okay. So before I kind of explain how quick works, I think it's useful to kind of go and do a parallel. So back in the day when like VMware first came out with virtual machines, I was blown away with a particular thing about them, which is that on my host computer, I can boot up, like say Linux as my virtual machine and the Linux boots up goes into through its boot up process. And finally, at some point I can log in. And once I'm logged in, I can, let's say, open up a uh, Chrome browser and I can navigate to like Google Docs, for example, I can start writing my document. And at some point I can just save the virtual machine into a disk and I can take that file and send it to a friend of mine. And that friend can then just open the file up and continue exactly where I left off, right? Specifically, they don't have to go through the boot up process, the login process, the opening up of the Chrome, or uh, Google Docs or anything like that, they're literally, bam, they're in the final thing and ready to go, right? And this is what I call resumable. Okay. And it is specifically how our current frameworks do not work, right? They can't do that trick. Instead, what they do is they essentially, every time you do navigate to a page, they, for all practical purposes, they have to boot up. And this boot up process is what we call hydration, is really the way the framework recovers all of the information about where the components are, where the listeners are, what is the data, and so on and so forth. And we have some tricks, like we can like prevent the client application from doing fetch requests back to the server by pre-fetching and pre-populating like local caches that we'll kind of inline into, into our page. But at the end of the day, like the application has to replay, right? It has to hydrate, it has to boot up, it has to go through all of these phases. Mm -hmm. And all of these phases, kind of slow us down in terms of the startup. What it means in practice is that if somebody sends you a link on Twitter or somewhere and says like, look at these awesome shoes, you should go buy them. You get the link, you click on it and you see the shoes immediately. And then you're like, oh yeah, I wanna buy it. I hit the add to shopping cart and nothing happens for several seconds, right? And at some point you're just like, you know what? I don't really need the shoes. <laughs> right. And you leave. And so if we can improve a startup performance, 
I think it's a huge impact for companies. And Amazon has done tons of studies on this that they basically published. And I don't know the exact numbers, but basically they say for every you know, 100 milliseconds that we can improve rendering performance and interactivity performance, it's like X million dollars worth of revenue for us, right? So they actually know this and they spent huge amounts of time and effort making sure that they can be as fast as possible. And so this one of the reasons actually that Amazon actually doesn't use any framework because all frameworks have this hydration or reasonable or replayability property, right? This startup cost property, and it would make the startup performance of Amazon slow. And so they have kind of a custom, I don't know what they do, but it's not any existing framework, right? I just wanted to comment real quick on the impulse buy of those shoes. Like, you know, first three <laughs> or four seconds, you're like, I want to buy these suckers. But the point is taken. It's just funny to think about somebody clicking a link and just like ready to buy shoes before the thing can even download the payload. That being said, around the world, different places, you know, maybe that could be eight, nine, 10, 12 seconds if things are not going well. So Google PageSpeed, right, emulates things. And you can go and uh, navigate to many popular brands. I don't want to call anybody out. And Google PageSpeed will say 30 seconds before the page is interactive. Really? And it's like common big brands, right? So the point is like, you can go and look at top 50 e-commerce websites. And you, what you will discover is that I think the number, like in terms of performance, like Google puts them in the red, yellow, and green bucket. Top 50 websites, right? Nobody's in the green. Green is a unicorn that doesn't exist. And I know for your simple Hello World website, you can probably get green, but I'm talking about a real e-commerce website with the real needs, right? Mm. Nobody's in the green. There are very few in the yellow. I believe Amazon is in the yellow. I believe Ikea is in the yellow. And Staples, which kind of surprises me, is in the yellow. Huh. And then everybody else, red for you. Wow. Even like Nike. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, assuming. Everyone. And so the interesting thing for me is that we have this thing in the industry where like, say your website is slow. What we do is we, we kind of blame the developers. Like, oh, your developers are not very good. They messed up. Like they should have done this, this, this. Like it's easy to kind of blame the developer for this thing. But it turns out the developer has actually very little choice about this. Or to put it differently, like if I practice the best practices for whatever framework I'm using, right? I will end up in a place that is less than ideal, right? Like you don't get performant website out of the box by just following the best practices, right? It's usually like some crazy hacks that you have to do and spend time on afterwards in order to get there. So I'd love to dig in a little bit actually on the, the virtual machine analogy. Yeah. Because I think it's quite interesting to think about, and I, I don't know the numbers on this, but when you send a virtual machine, with state, mm -hmm. it's booted up. I would assume, and correct me if you know know better on this, but you have to send much more data across because you're sending application state and all of these different things as mm -hmm. compared to simply booting from you know, a boot file or something like that. And I know mm -hmm. in the sort of web world, was it Cloudflare or someone was looking at doing web workers and trying to make them boot faster so that you know if you were running JavaScript, you wouldn't have to boot up the whole JavaScript process. And they compiled it down to a, an image in WebAssembly, and it was much, much faster to boot. But they're doing that on the machine, where sending bytes over the wire is not a problem. So I'm kind of curious, first of all, like, do you happen to know what is the space differential in terms of how much data you need to send to kind of boot up in space? And how does that play out when we're talking about something that's going to happen over a web connection, potentially a slow one? Yeah, so that's all excellent questions. Actually, I think the short answer is you're taking the analogy too far, I think. Ah, <laughs> fair enough. Okay. I was wondering that as well. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm trying to get at is that we have this property we call resumability, which is that the application can resume where the server left off. And what we mean by that is that at no point should there be duplication of work. Like if server did some work, then the client shouldn't have to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Now, in the normal VM machine, like, yes, you serialize the whole memory, which is huge, right? And that's not kind of how this works. Like we're not right. sending a, a serialized state in here. Instead, what we do is we basically say, what we want to do is we want to serialize the state of the application as well as the state of the framework. People forget about the state of the framework because usually the framework kind of deals for it on your own, right? But when you, let's say using Next.js with React, and by the way, I'm not picking on any particular framework, they all kind of work the same way. So I'm just gonna use React and Next.js because it's a common thing that people understand. So if you use Next.js and React, the Next.js will serialize your state, I think in something called a next data property or something like that. 
Yeah, it'll just dump that on the page and everything boots up from there. Yeah, it will just dump that on the page, right? So that's the state of the app, so to speak. But what it doesn't dump on a page, because React doesn't kind of expose it, is the state of the framework. What I mean by state of the framework is like framework needs to know like where are the components, where are the listeners, what do I do when you click on this button, and so on and so forth. There's a huge amount of state that exists inside of the React that isn't exposed to you. And you don't usually think about it, but it's there. And what Quick does is basically says, not only am I going to serialize the app state, which others already do, right? I'm also going to serialize the internal state of the framework itself, which others don't do, right? So that's one thing that we do differently. The second thing, and by the way, the amount of data isn't that big. Like the amount of state information is not that big, right? The second thing we do is we now have to also serialize things like where are the component boundaries? And we can serialize that directly into the HTML by adding special tags. And we also need to serialize where are the listeners in a DOM tree. And we can do that as well by adding special attribute tags into the HTML. So between HTML and your JSON payload that represents the state of the system, we can basically serialize everything we need to make this thing run. Now, of course, next question is like, well, where's the code? So that's the next big problem. And existing frameworks have this particular problem, which I call, you know, single entry point problem. What it means that that existing framework has a single main method, so to speak, right, where the application boots up. And this main method is the only way to get into the application system. And therefore, it's the only way to get the system up and running. And so there's the only way to create chunks, bundles, and so on and so forth. When you have something that's resumable, like Quick, let's say you just have a page with two buttons. If I click on button A, then I'm entering the system through a different path, different chunk, different code that I have to download than when I click on a button B. And so Quick not only has to figure out how to serialize all the state, it has a second problem, which is that it needs to take your source code and break it down into lots and lots of small JavaScript files. Or the other way to think about it is it has to break it up into lots of entry points, right? Every single interaction that you can do with a page is a potential entry point that re-enters the system in a different way. An existing uh, framework have this problem that like, well, they end up with a single chunk. And therefore, you have to download the whole thing at once. And not only this is the whole thing at once, you can't really resume it because you have to kind of execute the main method in order to kind of build up the internal things. What the Quick needs to do is needs to take this, the source code and break it up into lots and lots and lots of small ones, create lots of entry points. And then every component, every listener, every effect, and so on and so forth, becomes a separate entry point in a system. And then when I click button A, I only download the button's A behavior. And when I click on button B, I only download button B's behavior. So the end result here is that we are actually downloading a lot less code than an equivalent regular application. And specifically, if you look at a typical app, lots of components are what I would call static. In other words, they're there just kind of for the layout purposes. They don't actually do anything, right? And Quick can basically look at all this stuff and say, this is all static stuff. It's already service set rendered. I will never, ever need to re-render this on a client. And therefore, this code never gets shipped to the client. So you end up with actually a lot less JavaScript than you would on an equivalent framework application. So this is reminding me actually a lot about Svelte, which I think in some ways is different than React, Vue, Angular. They take because of the pre-compile. And I am not a Svelte expert, but I have played around with it a little bit. And I think they they do some amount of the same types of optimizations where because they're pre-compiling, they can have multiple entry points. If there's no dynamism, you don't get any JavaScript for a component. And they don't have this sort of virtual DOM thing, which creates that need for the centralized main loop that you have in like a Vue or a React. But I think they still do have a hydration problem. Yeah. So I'm kind of curious, are those problems deeply connected for you? They are. They are absolutely connected. Actually, I'm also not an expert at Svelte, but my understanding is that they only have one entry point. I don't think they can create separate ones. The thing that Svelte does really well is they can prune the tree, right? Because they don't have VDOM, they can prune the tree and say like, oh, these things never change and therefore I don't have to do updates on them. But they still have hydration because in order to recover the state, like Swelt is also reactive, which means like if something changes, they know how to just update a specific part on the page, which is all great. But in order to rebuild the information about where the components are, where the reactivity are, like if I change this data, I have to change this component and so on and so forth. In order to rebuild all this information, they have to execute the application at least once at the very beginning. 
the theme for all of these frameworks is that in order to recover the internal state of the framework, they have to execute the application. In the process of executing of the application is what rebuilds the internal state of the framework. And you're correct that different frameworks are, you can say, have different efficiency factors in terms of how good they are at rebuilding. But I think Quick is in a category of its own because it just serializes everything and you don't have to download anything in order to make a page interactive, right? So imagine anything you can build in like Swelt, you can build in React and vice versa, right? There's like, we all agree that all these frameworks are kind of universally the same thing, kind of apps that they allow you to build. And the same is true also for Quick, like whatever you can build in Svelte, React, Vue, Angular, and so on, you can also build in Quick. So the kinds of applications you build are absolutely identical. That's different is how the application resumes on the client and all kinds of other implications we can get into it in this show. But the resumability is kind of the key difference. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Square. Develop on the platform that sellers trust. Support Square sellers by building apps for today's business needs. As a Square app partner, you can reach millions of business owners searching for trusted software solutions. As a Square solutions partner, you can get hired by sellers on the Square platform, find new clients, and build apps that meet their needs. Square loves developers. They work hard to enable you to launch fast with their developer tools. You get a full sandbox environment, an interactive API explorer, live event monitoring, backend SDKs for PHP, Ruby, Java, .NET, Python, and Node. You get secure payment SDKs for iOS, Android, React Native, and Flutter. You get it all. Learn more and get started at changelog.com slash square. Again, changelog.com slash square. So I'm thinking about the statement that you said about the server side rendering and the client side rendering with quick. There's never any duplication. There's never any work that's done twice. And I'm curious, is Quick aware of server? Is the server aware of Quick? How does a server know the state of the page in order to not re-render things that have already been updated since it rendered last? Is there server side? Is it full stack? Or I don't understand exactly how it works. Yeah, yeah, so that's an excellent question. So the big difference is that, as I said, existing frameworks, really, they only care about client side rendering. And the reason why Quick can do all these things is that Quick doesn't just care about client-side rendering. It also cares about server-side rendering. It also cares about serialization of the data, sending the data across, deserialization, bundling, breaking the application into chunks, and so on and so forth. So in that sense, Quick is a full stack. Right? It cares about the whole thing because that's the only way Quick can deliver all of these things. Also, we also care about prefetching of the code as well. So basically, all of the concerns that you as a developer need to worry about in terms of like what makes an application performant are directly the responsibility or the thing that the framework cares about and has an opinion about and lays everything out for you. And so that's kind of the biggest difference between it is because we own the whole thing end to end, we can do certain things that others cannot. Like, let me give you an example. In order to break up the application into pieces, Let's take a simple example of, let's say you have a component that's a counter. There's a button, you click on a, count, a button and it increments, right? We need to be able to take this listener for the button and be able to lazy load it. Now, in this particular example, of course, when you click on a button, you're also gonna have to re-render the component and so they'll always come together. But like, let's say it's a more complicated example that sometimes you don't have to re-render it. So the problem is that you do something like a button on click equals, you know, state plus plus or something along those lines, right? You cannot take that function, the closure that increments the counter and lazy load it because it closes over the state, right? So if you pull out that function and make it lazy loadable by itself, the function will not work because it will say, well, what's the current count? Like I'm incrementing something, but what is it? How do I get it? Right. And if you just lazy load code, I say that the code has amnesia. Right? It doesn't have the information that you need. 
So as developers, we know how to serialize code. That's just JavaScript. We know how to serialize data. Well, that's just JSON. But what we don't really know is how to serialize closures, right? Closure is function plus data. And so the thing that Quick can do is it can serialize closures. So it can take the closure that represents your button that's, you know, add one to the count. And we know how to extract that on the top level and serialize the associated data with it and then make that whole thing lazy loadable. But the only way to do that is if the bundler and the runtime cooperate, right? But existing frameworks, they're like, bundling is not my problem. And therefore, a bundler can't do anything that would change the semantics of the code. Mm. And so the bundlers are very limited in what they can do because doing something crazy would make the application be broken, right? Whereas the frameworks are like, well, bundling is not our problem. And so the amount of things you can do are very minimal. We are, because we own the whole thing, we can do magical things where we can be like, oh, that's a closure that closes a bunch of variables. Let me extract it to a top level function. I understand which variables you closed over. I know how to serialize them. I know how to recover them. I'm going to make a special kind of function for you that, of course, won't run by itself. But the framework expects this, and the framework knows how to put everything back together in such a way to kind of recover everything, right? And so this is where the magic is. So you are transforming the code, you're applying custom compilations in order to make it resumable. That's right. Interesting. So you write code, Quick develop, DX, developer experience, right, is extremely similar to React. So if you know React, you know Quick. And this is intentional, right? This is not like, we thought about this and we're like, this is the way to do it. So we intentionally designed the DX to be like React. So you write your functions, your components, and so on and so forth. Now. Quick has a special thing where we add dollar signs to the API. So it's not use effect. We actually understand server and client, so we added an extra word in there. It's use client effect dollar sign. And a dollar sign communicates two things. It both communicates to the developer and also to what we call the optimizer, the thing that can rearrange the source code. So the optimizer, it basically says, pull this out as a lazy loadable thing. And to the developer, it basically says, special rules apply here. Like, you can't just do anything here. Like, you can do a lot of things, but special rules apply. And it's basically, the, the special rules are that you have to understand is, one, this thing is going to be uh, behind a lazy loaded boundary, which means it's a promise. It's not a direct thing. And two is, we can serialize lots of things, but not everything. So you, you have to be careful about like what kind of things are serializable. But you know, the framework will eagerly tell you that you know, you're trying to like capture something that's not serializable so that we have a good developer experience. But for the most part, you'd be surprised how we basically figured out how to serialize just about anything. So obviously, the basic things like objects, primitives are easy. But we know how to uh, serialize closures which is kind of mind blowing, but like, yes, we know how to serialize that. So that already gives you a lot of things. And we recently figured out how to serialize promises, which is even more mind blowing, right? Mm. <laughs> and so certain things we cannot serialize, like, um, I don't know, if you create a set interval and then, you know, you get a number back and it's a number like that has no meaning outside of the server or, you know, the, the place where you got right. it. Right. So there are constraints you have to understand and work with. But for the most part, you can just like write your application the way you want. We know how to break it up into pieces. And that's extremely difficult, by the way. Like that's, that's one of the blackest magic we have with Quick. I mean, I'm happy to go into the details. It's not like a secret or anything, right? Sure. But it is this thing that was super hard to figure out. And now because we have that, we get the resumability property, right? So that on the client, let's say you have the counter example. On a client, let's say you click the button that says, you know, add one. And let's say this button randomly decided whether or not to increment the value or not, right? So when you click on the button, the system has to download the closure that represents the incrementer. There's no choice about that. So you have to download that. And then let's say that button decides that it's not going to increment things because it's random. Then the system is done. There's nothing more to download. But if the button randomly decides, actually, I am going to increment the value, then now the system has to be reactive and say, oh, you modified this thing. Which component is invalidated because of the action you have done, right? And most frameworks are like, oh, I give up, just re-render everything. And then there's like ways to kind of prune the tree. Right. But when you say give up and render everything, you just mean like, oh, download the whole application. So that's not a thing for us. 
Reactive frameworks are like, oh, I know, you modified this, therefore I have to modify this component. And so they have an advantage. Except in order for them to rebuild the reactivity graph, they have to run the application once at the very beginning. So that's useless, right? So the thing that Quick understands is what is the reactivity graph? But this reactivity graph is actually serialized into the HTML so that when you go and modify the count value, Quick can say, aha, I know exactly which component I need to download and update. And so it can be extremely surgical about it, right? Now imagine a page where you have add to shopping cart, right? You have your prototypical shoe, you say add to the shopping cart, right? So when you hit that button, the code behind it will go probably and update some shopping cart data object, which then means that I have to re-render the shopping cart, right? So you have to download the code for clicking on the button for add to the shopping cart. And you have to download the code for the rendering of the shopping cart. But notice what you didn't download. First of all, you didn't download anything else on the page, but you didn't even download the component associated that originally rendered the button for adding to the shopping cart. Because like, well, you didn't change that part. You didn't re-rent down anything over there. So why should we even download this, right? So the one way to think about it is, one of the things that Quick is trying to do is to say, look, if you're gonna go through the trouble of downloading some JavaScript, then you better execute the whole thing, right? Like we don't want to be in a situation where like we download JavaScript and then don't execute it. Like so if you look at code coverage for a quick application, you should be pretty close to 100, right? Because we're only downloading and executing stuff that we actually need to do, right? And so the magical bit is like how do you take an application that is written in a standard react like way and break it up into lots and lots of entry points? create ideal bundle sizes and do all of this magic that needs to happen and then basically push all of this thing to the browser in a way where the developer doesn't have to think about any of this stuff. Mm. So I want to dig into one particular thing there and that's how are you thinking about how state moves through these different components? Because I was thinking about your example where you have a button mm -hmm. somewhere on a page mm -hmm. and you have a shopping cart somewhere else on the page and you change some state based on the button and it only impacts the shopping cart. Yeah. In many component-based applications, that state may live in like a prop or something that is propagated through a number of parents to get down into whatever the actual component that's depending on it is. Yeah. Our current implementation is inspired by MobX or kind of what I believe what Svelte does as well. So we have stores and stores have properties and you pass stores around. And then when you read from the store, that's how we know that a subscription has happened. And when you write into a store, that's how we know that you modified something. That's one way to do it. We're also actually thinking hard about what Solid.js does. They have signals. And that is a, another interesting thing that we would like to explore. We're kind of exploring it. We're, we're liking it. We'll, we'll see where the thing actually lands. But yeah, the idea is that you pass stores rather than props so that you don't do much prop drilling. You can also have context, et cetera. But yeah, if you do the classical prop drilling, then you have the problem that you will force re-rendering all throughout the system and that you don't want to do that, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Vue also has a store-based system a lot of the time. So yeah, it's... Yeah. What I'm kind of getting at is that like your developer experience for building an application is very much unchanged. And it's probably closest to React, but like maybe some things like stores from Vue or Svelte, et cetera. But fundamentally, the DX is something you're very, very familiar with, right? But that's not what we're selling here. Like we're not selling you a better DX. We're selling you a better experience for your end user because we are smarter in the way we bundle, execute, and deliver the information to the client. So what's the practical difference then? So like what you're offering with Quick, let's say the DX is relatively the same as you using React, mm -hmm. you know, put some dollar signs at the end of things. There's a few more rules or different rules. What's the practical difference? Is it an order of magnitude in a complicated application? Like yeah, we're yeah. talking about your app's going to be 10x faster, 100x. Like what happens when I use Quick instead of React? Yeah, so we have our homepage, Builder.io homepage, and we actually have that homepage. Originally it was a Next.js React homepage. And uh, we just switched it over to Quick. And actually, we have the ability to run both pages simultaneously. So if you go to Builder.io, question mark, render equals next, you get the Next.js one. Mm. If you just do without anything, you get the Quick one. If you open up in Chrome, sorry, if you open up in Google PageSpeed, we get, I think, around 40. Our score is in Google PageSpeed on in Next.js and about 95 in Quick. Now, I'm not picking up a Next.js. Like we could have done this in any other framework. I think the numbers will be about the same because they all fundamentally have 
hydration that's happening. And what you're really paying for is the hydration here, right? Okay. So no matter which framework you kind of choose out of that category, I think you'll see similar numbers. If you go to Chrome and if you open up, you know, DevTools and you can go to the performance and the performance you record the startup thing, what you'll see is that Builder IO page on a, on a you know, desktop computer spends, I believe, something around 80 milliseconds executing JavaScript at startup. And that includes quick and party town and third party scripts and everything, right? And in the Next.js version, it takes, I believe, 800 milliseconds. So we're talking 10x improvement in the amount of JavaScript that the browser has to execute on startup. But I think the improvement is even greater because when you have a regular framework, like let's go to the example of somebody sends you a link to the shoe and there's a buy button you wanna click. When you do the normal frameworks, right? You render everything, there's a button and you click on the button and nothing's happened because you clicked on it too early, right? And so you have to wait until hydration is finished before you can click on a button. And that can take time. And you know, on a mobile device, it can take literally tens of seconds. Mm -hmm. The nice property of Quick is that the moment Quick HTML loads, the HTML contains all of the information about where the listeners are. And it also includes little tiny, what we call a polyfill, which is a piece of JavaScript that sets up a global listener for everything at the root which is super tiny. It's about one kilobyte and executes in like under 10 milliseconds. It costs nothing, basically. And this polyfill is ready to listen for things immediately, right? So as soon as the HTML shows up with a button, inlined inside of the HTML is a script tag that already executed, is already listening for click buttons. So when you go and click, that click goes directly and gets immediately processed. And now, of course, you have to fetch the JavaScript, but instead of fetching this huge thing, which is the whole application, you're fetching just the code necessary for that button, right? You cannot get any more efficient. Like we have removed everything that is strictly not needed and we ended up with the absolute bare essential. Like there's nothing else left to remove. The other thing we do is we also know statistically and also we can kind of guess through heuristics as to what are the possible things that you as a developer can do. And so even before you click on a button, we already instruct the browser with a prefetch links to say like, this is most likely what's going to happen. So go and start prefetching this JavaScript. We don't execute the JavaScript. We're just prefetching it. But the nice property is that if we guess wrong and you click on a button, your request goes in front of the prefetch requests, right? So you immediately even pull yourself up. So all of this basically means is that you are essentially ready to interact with the page immediately. It's hard to imagine a scenario where the interaction would be even better. Like, I don't know what else could be removed out of this particular thing, this equation, right? Just a blank page, you know, just white, just nothing. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so why did you guys build this? Was Builder.io too slow and you hit a roadblock and you're like, we can't possibly make it any better because of hydration. And so here comes, you know, I'm Mishko, I'm good at making frameworks, I'm going to make one. Or <laughs> what was the genesis of why would you build quick and not just do what the rest of us do, which is ship like kind of slow websites that are still okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a good question. Actually, back in 2019, I think, I gave a talk in ng-conf on like, crazy stuff I think about. And in this talk, I actually propose this idea of resumability. Now, I think the idea is, I don't know of any other frameworks at the time that had this concept of resumability, but Google internally had this thing called Wiz, or still has this thing called Wiz, which by the way, runs Search and Google Photos, and those are very interactive, fast sites, right? And it doesn't quite have resumability, it depends on how you define it, but it has this idea of having these global listeners and putting as much information into the DOM as possible so that the, the client can, for all practical purposes, resume. The reason I'm kind of hesitating to use the word resume is because there is no equivalent like execution on a server that saves the state and then sends it. It's more like the server runs Java code, has nothing to do with anything and like it just pre-assembles everything in the correct order. But the effect is essentially the same, that you have these super fast startup applications, right? So Wiz is kind of maybe the inspiration for this particular thing. And I wanted to see like, could I take some, some these ideas behind Wiz and turn it into, at that point, Angular? But what I realized along the way is that the kind of changes you have to do to the framework are so drastic that it would not be possible to basically you were in a sense you would be making a brand new framework 
right? Like you come to Quick and you're like, oh, it kind of looks like React. So you think it's React. It's like, well, yes, for 99% of the time, but the 1% of the time, it is so different that it will definitely break your stuff, <laughs> right? You can't have a, a framework that's like 99% compatible, right? Like that doesn't work <laughs> because, you know, even the simplest stuff usually has huge number of things and that 1% will basically make sure that your app will never run. I'd be curious to dig into what that 1% is. If I were to take a React app and try to drop it in Quick, what would break? Yeah, a few things. So first of all, Quick has to have this concept of asynchronous rendering. What I mean by that is that all the existing framework have this idea of asynchronous rendering. When you call the render function, like all the data has to be ready to go and you have to, and you render, right? Now there are, I would say hacks or like React suspense where like, oh, we come across a promise. So like we basically stop the rendering quit and then the promise gets resolved, we restart the rendering from the root and hopefully we'll end up in a different place, right? That's not really what I mean by asynchronous rendering. What I mean by that is, no, our rendering system can actually render things and then it comes across like a lazy loaded boundary, like a component and says, well, I have to wait, it's a promise. And so it literally waits in that, so when the promise resolves, it continues where it left off and continues going further. And it's not just lazy loading components, but also lazy loading data that also has this particular problem. And then when you do that, you have this problem of like, well, I can't render directly to the DOM immediately because if I do, then the user will see intermediate values and we don't want to do that, right? So you have to have kind of a journal that says like, these are all the operations I have to apply to the DOM when everything is done. Once I finish rendering, so to speak, internally, I flush the DOM operations. Now, the nice benefit of that is that when the framework runs, it doesn't run in like these huge monolithic execution blocks, right? Instead, it's just all these tiny little promises being resolved. What it means is that for animation, this is great because there is really no point where we have huge, large operations, right? It's always broken up into lots of small async operations. And if the browser needs to like insert itself and like do some updates or animations or something like that, it can always do so. Yeah, that's great. You're never gonna freeze the browser that way. Yeah, it's a nice benefit. And so when you actually look at quick applications running, if you look at Google PageSpeed scores, you'll see that there is lots of stuff happening when, when, you know, when you're updating things, but it's all tiny little things. And so the browser never has, basically gives you this red flag saying like, you took 40 milliseconds to do something and therefore you messed up my rendering of the you know, updates of animations. So that, that doesn't actually happen. And it's, it's an interesting side effect. Like we didn't intend to do solve this particular problem, but like we just unintentionally solved it because of just how the system works. What's going on, party people? This episode is brought to you by our friends at Hasora. Hasora lets you create dynamic, high-performance GraphQL and REST APIs from your databases in minutes with granular authorization and caching baked in. All this without touching your underlying database. Go from data to API in literally minutes. As the technology landscape evolves, a key bottleneck for teams is making data accessible, especially in enterprise environments. Modernizing applications and building new features is critically dependent on being able to shape, control, and ship your data to interfaces demanding always available real-time access. Asura solves this problem by connecting your databases, your REST servers, your GraphQL servers, and third-party APIs to provide a unified, real-time GraphQL API across all your data sources. Imagine your tech stack is a Postgres database, Go is your backend language, REST APIs, and vendors who only expose REST and React for your front end. Hasora can give you an instant GraphQL API for your front end, an API that's protected with roles, caching, and everything you expect from a secure API, and the ability to connect all your services into a single API. All this while ensuring the performance, the security, and the reliability requirements of your API layer. The most important business value Hasora provides is reducing time to market. Imagine if your team can go from data to API in literally minutes, it would be a game changer. Everything they do is through the lens of making developers productive and getting to production ready in minutes. 
The easiest way to get started with Hasora is with Hasora Cloud. It is fully managed and scales as you grow. Head to hasora.io slash jsparty. That's H-A-S-U-R-A dot I-O slash jsparty. Again, hasora.io slash jsparty. And by our friends at Sourcegraph, they recently launched Code Insights. Now you can track what really matters to you and your team in your code base. Transform your code into a queryable database to create customizable visual dashboards in seconds. Here's how engineering teams are using Code Insights. They can track migrations, adoption, and deprecation across the code base. They can detect and track versions of languages or packages. They can ensure the removal of security vulnerabilities like Log4j. They can understand code by team, track code smells and health and visualize configurations and services. Here's what the engineering manager at Prezi has to say about this new feature. Quote, as we've grown, so has a need to better track and communicate our progress and our goals across the engineering team and the broader company. With Code Insights, our data and migration tracking is accurate across our entire code base and our engineers and our managers can shift out of manual spreadsheets and spend more time working on code, end quote. The next step is to see how other teams are using this awesome feature. Head to about.sourcegraph.com slash code dash insights. This link will be in the show notes again, about.sourcegraph.com slash code dash insights. So you were telling us why you built Quicket Builder. You're getting very excited. I can tell you get very excited about these things. And we never actually learned the real nut of why, you know, finish the story, so to speak. Yes. I gave the talk in, I think it was May 2019. I can't remember at NGConf. And I kind of laid it out. And even in that talk, I actually talked about reasonable, the idea of reasonability. If you have time, you should watch it. I think it's kind of hilarious because whenever I watch it, I'm like, this is exactly like, it's amusing to me just how many, even the vocabulary, how I got right. Anyways, so I kind of made the talk and then nothing happened for years. And it was kind of in the back of my head. And so I started kind of experimenting with it about last year. And at the same time, I kind of want to just try something different, something new, right? I mean, I was at Google for 16 years and that's a long time to be anywhere. I kind of was feeling like, you know, I'm either going to like retire here or I have to like try new things and explore new things. And so I started exploring and I came across a company called Builder.io. And what I found fascinating about them is that they had a kind of a visual editor that allows marketing folks to update the websites, but in a way where it's compatible with the engineer's vision of components and engineer's vision of like, oh, I'm using React. And so like, I don't want you to just like randomly do random stuff. I want you to actually basically create a React component uh, in my page. So it was kind of a headless CMS system, but it's based on components rather than fields. And that's kind of the big differentiator about it. Hmm. And because it's based on the components, if the customer has a React application, then they generate a React component. And if the customer has an Angular application, they generate an Angular component and so on and so forth, right? Hmm. And so that's a lot of work to generate all the different outputs. And so they built this other tool called Mitosis. And Mitosis allows them to say like, oh, we have this general concept of a component that needs to be built. It's like a counter or whatever, because whatever the marketing decided in their drag and drop editor to kind of build, and they can spit out like whatever format that's canonical to whatever technology stack you happen to have. And that's how this whole thing works. Now, what's interesting about it is that I was like, hmm, if I was to build another framework, one of the hard things would be to get customers. But if you have this thing called mitosis that spits out whatever output you want, it would be trivial to get a quick output out of this as well. So that was the one thing that kind of attracted me to Builder. But why Builder was attracted to me is because they had this thing that they're building the headless CMS systems and all the engineers are like, oh yeah, but headless CMS systems are going to slow my site down. You're going to slow things down. And so, you know, they're always saying like, no, no, we're fast. We're actually not slowing anything down. But then the people would build websites and they'd be like, well, the website is slow. And then, and then you'd be like, yeah, because like hydration and things like not because of us, we just gave you a React component that you just dropped into your page. Right. And so if the application is slow, it's not because of us, like it's because you have lots of components on a page, right? And so the realization was like, it didn't matter whether they were using React or Svelte or Angular or Vue, the websites all performed about the same. 
Like I know every single framework claims that they're the fastest, but if you actually look at what's actually happening in the real world, they're all about the same. There's two reasons why they're slow, right? One is hydration, which kind of we've been talking about all this time. And the other one is third-party code. But before I talk about those two things, like let me just close the room, right? So Builder was like, gee, you know, like we would, would be awesome if we could come to a customer and be like, yeah, you know, the performance is about the same on all of these, these different things. It's not us. It's just the way these things work. But what if you could come up with a different framework that would just like blow the performance out of the way, right? And because you have mitosis, it's easy to come to the customer and be like, just push this button over here and we'll generate quick instead of Angular or instead of Vue or instead of whatever you happen to be using. And when we generate quick, look how fast this thing is, mm -hmm. right? And so it was kind of like match made in heaven. And so kind of we joined on it and we started working on it together. Like I started working on it full time, but also in the, in the context of what Builder eventually will become. And so we're pretty close to this particular thing. Anyways, so why is your website slow? The short answer is too much JavaScript. There are two pieces to that part. One is you sort of control, but not really, which is the application code that you have written, your first party code. And the second part is the third party code, which you don't really control because marketing comes in and says, we need Google Analytics, we need HubSpot, we need Amplitude, we need whatever, like Facebook Pixel, right? 25 things. Yes, on average, like 30 things or something are. Well, and that's frequently an order of magnitude slower than the first party code. So until you address that, the framework's in the noise. Correct, correct. Don't you just put an async on the script loader, though, and you're done? You just put async. <laughs> and then you're just like, well. No. Have you seen how much CPU some of those advertising <laughs> scripts chew up? Yeah, but I used the async keyword on the attribute on the script. So we started working on Quick, and very quickly we basically realized exactly this, is that the third-party code is kind of ruining the party here, right? And so the realization we had is that if you just make a blank page with nothing on it, and you add Google Tag Manager by itself, it puts you at the precipice of no longer getting 100 out of 100 on Google PageSpeed score, right? <laughs> and so like, if that's the situation, and that's just one of like 20 other things you have to add, like you're not gonna win this battle. And so Party Town was born. The idea is you take third-party code and you run it in the web worker. Now, that idea is not new, right? There's nothing like clever about that thing. That's like an obvious thing. The problem is, how do you do that? Because the web worker doesn't have DOM and all of these scripts do something like document.title or they say document.evenlistener click or like whatever that they do, right? Yep. In there. And so they don't have DOM. And so people have tried to make kind of like fake DOMs in the web worker. And that doesn't really work because they kind of go out of sync and a lot of things actually want to measure things like, oh, how big is the box or where am I on a page or, you know, things of that sort. And so none of that stuff really works if you have a kind of a fake DOM. So you need to have a real DOM. And one thing you could do is you can make a proxy, meaning that whatever operations you do on a web worker, you also do on the main thread. And by proxying everything over, you can just have the script running inside of the web worker. And if it says like, what's the document.title, you just go at the main thread and say, well, what is the document.title? And then you return that back. Now, all of that works easy, except for one tiny problem. And that is that the communication channel between the web worker and the main thread is asynchronous. Meaning that if the web worker says, what is document.title? By the time you come back and figure out what the title is and report back, it's too late. The code has executed past this point and it's probably crashed because you couldn't really answer the question correctly, right? And so the magical bit that Partytown figured out is how to make a synchronous call from the web worker to the main thread. So we've figured out a way to block the execution of the web worker so that we can go and talk to the main thread asynchronously. And then when we come back, we can resume running the web worker with the, the script from where we left off. So that's the whole magic, right? And so we put this together inside of Partytown and Partytown is great because people just add it to their website and they'll increase their score, you know, 20, 30 points on Google PageSpeed score just by adding it. Yeah. And it's not like you have to change anything, right? Like it's just third party scripts. And so just moving them over to a web worker can have a huge impact on your performance. So I'm sold on Partytown because we have very little JavaScript on our site and very little third-party JavaScript. But what we do have is reCAPTCHA because freaking spam bots. Yes. And reCAPTCHA kills my scores. 
I'm just like, yep. everything I do is fast, but I got recaptcha. Yep. And I can't take it off because the spam bots would increase. Party town. Yeah, party town. It's a drop in. I don't got to do anything. I just drop it in. That's spectacular. Right. So party town is like a no brainer. Like you just need to do party town. It's just a no brainer. But now when you do party town and you move the third party scripts over, now you have the next problem. And the next problem is the framework itself, right? And this is where Quick comes in. What really what Builder wants to have is wants to have kind of a solution where both the marketing people that are not code aware can go and edit the page and as well as engineers can edit the page in their own ways. And the whole thing kind of comes together and we can be unbelievably fast. And so things like personalization, A-B testing, et cetera, things that are historically very, very difficult to do with classical systems become super easy with Quick and Party Town. Okay, well, you wanted to say something I could tell. I was going to ask if there's any limitations on what can run in Party Town. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, so there are some limitations. Like, in theory, you can execute everything, but the question is, how good are our proxies about, like, simulating the environment? Yeah. And we've been getting better and better about all these surprises. For that part, kind of most things can run. But there is a performance penalty for running them. Now, it's a third-party script, so I really don't care how long it takes for Google Analytics to boot up and send some data to Google, right? That, that doesn't really matter whether it takes... 50 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds, like whatever, right? Yeah. What I care about is that the user isn't getting blocked on the main thread. Like that's the thing that matters, right? So if you try to run like a React application or, or you know, any framework, it doesn't have to be React, right? In a web worker, it works, but you can definitely see that it's kind of sluggish, right? But it is possible, right? But that's not the point of the thing. The point of it is not to run the application in the third part in the web worker, right? The point is to run all these analytics in a web worker off the main thread so that the main thread is dedicated to the application and to the user. Good answer. So we're running short on time. We could have you back for a whole other hour probably, Mishko. This thing goes deep. Happy to come back, man. We have a few questions from the chat. Let's do a few quick ones here. Jarvis asks if there's any real-world production websites using Quick. We know Builder's using it, but are there anybody else? I know it's pretty new, but have you gotten any people using it? And are they seeing the same thing y'all are seeing? Yes, we are. So Builder has it. Obviously, the Quick homepage has it. We actually, Builder has a couple of customers that are actually using Builder in production. So that's exciting. And there are also, in our community, people have like built like their own personal work, uh, pages, et cetera, in Builder as well. It's happening, but we are still kind of early on in the game. Right. I think we're couple, maybe a month or so away from declaring uh, like beta. One of the things we are trying to do is we want to make sure that the whole stack works end to end, which includes so there's Quick, on a, which is the framework, Quick City, which is kind of like Next.js, the meta framework that goes on top of it. And then on top of that, we have this thing called Quick SDK. And a quick SDK is the thing that glues the quick city website with Builder. So you would only use quick SDK if you wanted to integrate with Builder. Mm. But we wanted to have, kind of have the whole stack running before we declare beta. And we're getting very, very close. Also loving the way quick city has turned out. Another talk for another day. Another talk for another day. I would love to dig into that with you. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. Peter Banjo wonders, can quick work with different JS server frameworks like Fastify, Express, or... Yes. So that's another thing we kind of worked hard on. The Quick itself doesn't use any API, which means anywhere there's JavaScript library or JavaScript available will run, right? So we have adapters for Dino, for Fastly, for Cloudflare, for just about anything you can imagine, including Node.js. So you could just set up your environment that you happen to be running in as long as it is JavaScript, right? Quick can run that over there. We even have it running in a service worker because when you go to our examples, our tutorial pages, we actually allow you to play with the apps. And so instead of being server-side rendered on the server, they actually get server-side rendered in the service worker. Okay, interesting. What about debugging tools or anything special for Quick? Anything that you'd run into using it built into? Uh, it's a standard debugging story. You know, in the browser, you can just put breakpoints, et cetera, as you would imagine. Same thing happens on a you know Node.js or whatever. You just open up the Node.js debugger, place breakpoints, everything works. The only difference is kind of that you have to understand that like there is server and a client, and the code could be running on both locations, and so you might have to like execute things. You might have to debug things in a server versus debugging in a client. But the source maps works and all the other standard stuff. And and our transformations on a source code are usually like 
very simple, as in like, take this code and move it over here. And so the source maps work very, very well. Mm. So it's not like we rename the variable names or we introduce extra things or move the code around or anything like that. It's very mechanical of like, this code goes here and this code goes there. And so the source maps work beautifully. Last one, Party Town. What about the payload? How, what, what's the cost of including Party Town on our page? Is it significant? Is it insignificant? That's a good question. I don't remember. I want to say it's like few kilobytes that goes into the main thread. Okay. And then I don't know how big is what gets loaded in the web worker thread. Probably like on the order of several kilobytes. I, I don't actually know. Okay. So I'm just making stuff up. But it's not that big. But the gains you get is that you offload these huge things like Google Tag Manager, right? Right. Off of the main thread. And so any kind of additional calls that Party Town brings in is insignificant compared to the savings you get from moving this thing out. Very cool. Well, the website is quick.builder.io. That's with a W and a K, because you can't spell things the normal way that's right. and still have a trademark. You know, we got to spell things differently. <laughs> so that's where it is. Of course, it's in your show notes, listener. All the links to all the things are in the show notes. So if you're interested in Quick, if you're ready to drop Party Town into your page and enjoy the third party sequestering your third parties into a web worker, definitely check the show notes for that. Mishko, anything else you have to say? We really appreciate this conversation. It's been very interesting. I think it's like tantalizing. There's still a lot of things that I have questions about, but we're going to call it a show. Any final words before we let you go? Thanks for having me. You bet. There's many things we haven't talked about, specifically the magic we can do on a server side, optimizations, et cetera. So if you want to go into some crazy nitty gritty stuff, I would love to come back and get in there. But thanks for having me. And the main thing I really wanted to get across is that there are lots of existing frameworks. And Quick is not yet just another one that has a different DX. Like it's a fundamental rethink from the ground up of how a web application should work. And hopefully I was able to kind of convey that in the, in the chat. I think so. And I will say this, K-Ball has been very polite. He's been biting his tongue the whole last 20 minutes. He has so many things to ask and he's asked zero of them. So we can definitely have you back. Maybe K-Ball can go one-on-one -on -one and just have a deep dive into the nerdery of how these things are fitting together. K-Ball. Uh, does that sound cool or do you have any more questions? <laughs> I was just thinking as you were saying there was so much I was like I feel like we could talk for hours yeah. on these. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're game, I'm game. Let's find some time. Yeah, anytime, anytime. I'm game. All right. Very good. Well, for Cable, I'm Jared. This has been JS Party. Thanks for listening, everybody, and we will talk to you all next week. Are you sold on quick? How about Party Town? Should we do a whole episode on that or nah? Let us know in the comments. We would love to hear from you. There's a discussion link in your show notes. And if you're a longtime listener of JS Party, maybe join our membership program. Ditch the ads, directly support our work, get bonuses like extended episodes, and land yourself a free pack of stickers while you're at it. That way your laptop will look fresh and new when you're coding at the park, the library, or the bar slash pub. Sick front end feud callback. Thanks again to our partners at Fastly for the super fast bandwidth, to fly.io for serving up our changelog.com app, to the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder for these dope beats, and to you for listening. We appreciate it. Next up on the pod, Amel returns after a lengthy hiatus, and she's going one-on-one -on -one with Fred K. Shot talking about Astro and their big 1.0 release. We'll have that episode ready for you next week.